So one of the uh, ways we might um, caption the, the theme of, of this week's reflections is the difference between meditation and medication. It's um, one of those words that uh, always comes up differently in spell checks. So you get medication, mediation, and medication. And of course, although they're different meanings, they come from the same, same root. Um, the word medicine and the word meditation are closely related. Uh, the prefix med in uh, Indo-European and later in Greek has uh, a very definite uh, sense. It has the sense of, uh, well, literally, it's sometimes translated as thinking, but it's not thinking just in our ordinary cognitive sense, you know, thinking about a problem or thinking about the best way to cork. Um, it's uh, consciousness, really. It's conscious life, awareness. It's in the full sense, probably more uh, of an application of wisdom. So it's, it's the idea of, of consciousness more than cognition. But it also carries with it the sense of caring. Uh, if you think about something, it's because you care about it. If you think about someone, it's because you care for them. I'll think about you. Uh, and reflection or pondering, but with a definite sense of caring and attention. So at the, at the, at the root, or at least in the prefix of these two concepts of meditation and medicine, we have this idea of caring and uh, attention, suggesting both compassion and wisdom. And also related to um, giving advice or coming to a decision, for example, just as a medical practitioner would um, give advice or come to a decision about treatment that's contained in this, this broad meaning uh, of the word we could translate as thinking or being conscious with a, a compassionate uh, intention or attention. So, to think about the meaning of medicine uh, is really to think about the meaning of compassion and of wisdom. And meditation and medicine are both activities, one more interior perhaps, one more exterior, but both of them are activities that are related to health, to making the human condition more whole, promoting health or restoring health. The word health uh, is also a, a word that has rich uh, layers of meaning, interconnected layers or levels of meaning. Uh, it comes from an old English word, hal, which means health or to be whole, uh, to be holy, in fact. These concepts are not, uh, came perhaps in a different times, but they are all related to the word uh, to health. Wholeness, being sound, being well, uh, but also being prosperous, being happy, being safe, being content, and in the fullest sense of the word of a healthy human being, to be holy, to be in touch with the whole, to be one with the whole that we are part of. Our modern idea of wholeness is often kind of rather institutionalized religiously, you know, to be acknowledged as holy you have to be canonized and as a sort of official stamp of approval, but I think we all have known holy people in our lives, 
we don't get necessarily the stamp of approval, but we, we know that to be near them, to learn from them, to consult them, uh, makes us feel more connected to something life-giving and uh, reassuring and affirming. So holiness is, in a sense, some kind of energy or some kind of condition that can be that is, is contagious. If you're with a holy person, if, you know, we've all been with holy people or people in holy moments, uh, and it sort of transmits itself. You feel better for being in the presence of people like that. And it's not something you can reduce just to what they say or advice they give or instructions they have for you. It's more a uh, quality of being. And that quality of being, of course, is essential to any, any uh, healing art. Um, some years ago I was visiting a person in hospital in London at tea time and the nurses and nursing assistants were bringing cups of tea to the patients in bed and I was watching the different nurses doing it in different ways. Some would come with uh, clearly a lot of stress, a lot of impatience or without the connection with themselves that allowed them to smile uh, and so you know, delivering a cup of tea was kind of a job they were doing and the, there was no connection uh, in that work with the patient that they were caring for and clearly then you know, it wasn't a very healing act you, know, you might say well maybe bringing a cup of tea to somebody is you know not the most important part of the healing process, but it is an important part of the healing process, whether people feel better or not. And then there were other nurses or assistants who uh, were in a different space and were connected to themselves and had perhaps just as many problems on their mind as the other nurses, but uh, were able, for one reason or another, to pay attention do it caringly, and with the meaning of the prefix med, to be caring, to be attentive uh, and compassionate. And uh, they put the cup of tea down beside the patient with a, a smile or a nice word, you know, here's a cup of tea, dear. And it didn't take them any longer to do it uh, than the others. So it's the quality of consciousness, the quality of mind that makes a big difference, of course, to any organization. We know that when you walk into a shop, and uh, if the shop assistant is just couldn't care less, you know, you're looking for something, and they say, no, we haven't got it, you know, and another shop assistant will say, no, you know, what exactly is it you want, and maybe I can help you find somewhere else to get it. So that quality of attention uh, is very intimately connected with kindness, with simple human kindness small acts of kindness. When John Mayne was once asked uh, what is the best way to prepare for meditation, uh, you know, he didn't say, as he sometimes would, um, you know, take some quiet time or listen to some music or do some yoga or uh, take some time to read. Um, but on this occasion, for some reason, he said small acts of kindness. The best way to prepare for your period of meditation is to build up for it, prepare for it by small and um, demanding acts of, of kindness to others. So, um, so this idea of, of, of health is related to wholeness, of being connected to the whole, and that means, of course, being connected to other people, as well as to ourselves, and to the big design that we are part of. And um, it also has the sense of, um, of holiness and healing. So, the, that's in 
I don't know what the Irish, uh, what is the Irish word for health? A slanter. A slanter. Slanter. Slanter, I suppose, when you drink. Lice, lice is there too, and that comes to okay. the yucky dance. Just the sand pill. So, slanter is a head, but lice is another derivative of it, you know, you know so of course lice is head system. Right. Uh, the kids use the uh, yucky, yucky da, which yucky da. That's a good, that's a good hence with Welsh we say we would say slanter, but it comes with shows a different roots. But uh, lice would be our equivalent of their yucky. Yeah. It's funny we, we we have this word health associated yeah. with <laughs> with, uh, with with drinking too. Yeah, isn't yeah. It? yeah. We should next maybe we should then have a government. Health warning on that. Slanter for moderation. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what, does, what does the word, uh, do, you, do you know anything about the etymology of the word? The roots of the As slanter safe. Slanter safe. Yeah. safe. Mm. So it's probably be, very be, close be, to the be, be safe. Yeah. Be yeah. safe. Yeah. To be healthy is to be safe. Okay. Any connection with holy? Um, it's interesting that uh, grammatical lice would be kind of kind of like medicines or lice would come there, but that's where a healing medi medication would come from. But it's interesting you're saying about he about holy. Holy in Ireland is a, is a very is a very interesting word. Anyway, it goes back thousands and thousands of years, go back to the Indo European uh, and it's called Naev. Naev, mm. Naev and Naev and knee is to wash. So Nita is washed. Made clean. Mm -hmm. So, ni, ni, nita, neaf, ne padric, is then patric, ne breed. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting that um, the saints came in San, San uh, you would say, San Seamus or San Nicholas, is the Christian one of Sanctus. But I know in our hospital, St. James, James is, some people call it San Seamus, while Nave Seamus would be. Holy, so the old old saints, a lot of them in long, long before mm. the saints came in. So you're right, the holy person was called Nave. Mm. So holiness goes back to cleanse, and Nave is the Irish name, Nave, and yeah. it's all someone who's clean, holy, mm. pure. So purity, holiness, cleanliness is Nave, while Sanctus just comes in with bronze, with bronze, you know. Thank you. So that's where it comes in. Oh. I hope all oh my. Questions are asked. Ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very much. So, um, and uh, in, in Spanish, salud, I think, is yeah. is is, uh, is both health and actually salvation. It's health and salvation, and salve is to yeah. like a salve or an ointment or something to purify something to clean it. Yeah. So. How does that relate? We might we might explore uh, with our medical idea of health. I suppose we have the idea of, of hygiene, but uh, the idea of does the medical idea of health, as we developed it in modern times, um, seem smaller and um, less rich, less human than uh, these ancient uh, meanings of, of health? Um, there have always been people uh, in human societies who have specialized in health, in making people feel better, uh, whether witches or witches to acupuncture, uh, particularly, of course, in relieving pain. I think it's it's a relatively modern idea that the idea of the medicine man or woman uh, is uh, there to prolong life. That's quite a new but very dominant idea, isn't it, in modern medicine, that we're really there to extend life. So we need to come back to that as well. But why, why are we so concerned about prolonging life? Uh, saving life. The original idea of medicine was to make life feel better and to relieve particular uh, instant instances of pain. Uh, but the concept of a painkiller that's very central to our idea of instant medicine today, of course, 
is, uh, is very recent. I think that phrase, painkiller, uh, only came in in the 19th century. And uh, even now, it's only present in English, uh, the idea of killing pain. The idea before was that you alleviate it. Um, at the same time as we got used to this idea of pain as being an enemy that needed to be killed, uh, we began to think of ourselves as having diseases, <coughs> rather than just being sick. But we actually had a disease. And um, so we you know, still say to people, you know, what have you got? <laughs> what's, what's got into you? Uh, and we pick up diseases. So, I mean, these, and these are ideas that may or may not be right, I, I don't know, but they certainly have changed our way of thinking of, of health. So the medical idea of health uh, today um, does take us to the heart of um, our idea of, of meaning, really, and it shapes how we deal with all the experiences of life. I mean, health, as we've seen, is a, is a very central concept of the human condition. Uh, it involves our sense of wholeness, our sense of connection to others. Maybe this afternoon we can uh, look at the story that I finished with yesterday, uh, the story of uh, Jesus healing uh, daughter Jairus and uh, the woman with the hemorrhage, whom doctors had not been able to cure, and uh, she had spent, if you remember, she spent all her money on doctors, and still wasn't cured. Uh, and uh, in that story, Jesus uh, feels power going out of him in the crowd. So there's something very personal about being touched by a sick person who is looking for healing. And that personal connection stands out even in a big crowd when everybody else is just jostling uh, for no particular reason except to be close to the celebrity. But if there's a real personal need, uh, then that creates a personal connection. Well, those of you who work with the sick and the suffering uh, I, I think know what that means, that sense of personal connection. We're professionally concerned about boundaries and professional limits, but at the same time, uh, health and healing they do seem to require a personal connection. Or in traditional view, views, uh, this personal connection is essential to the uh, one that doesn't, that is focused, it doesn't overstep the boundaries, uh, the limits, but it's an essential element of the healing process to feel this connection. Um, and then if you remember, uh, Jesus stops in the crowd and he feels this power going out of him through this touch, personal connection, and he says, who touched me? And he sort of demands that this individual uh, steps forward. And if you think of what is involved at culturally and psychologically in that story, for a woman who touched the man deliberately and who is hemorrhaging, uh, clearly she shouldn't have been there in the crowd at all. And uh, she didn't belong there. She, she was an outcast, impure outcast. So uh, to call her out into the crowd might seem an act of cruelty. And yet, uh, is it? What is achieved by her? She comes out trembling, you remember. She's very self-conscious. She's very nervous. Uh, what's, what's achieved by her coming out like this and telling people what was wrong with her and that she has been healed? 
Well, clearly, I suppose she is reconnected, isn't she, to her community, to her people. Uh, and this is a public, a public or social aspect of her healing, her reintegration, uh, her becoming part of the whole, the social whole, uh, in a way that she had been uh, denied before by her illness. So we might come back to other aspects of that story um, this evening and we'll look at some other stories later. Um, so how does our medical idea of health, restricting health to a medical definition or de medical condition, how does that relate to uh, what meditation, for example, tells us about wholeness and the healing process. And how does it, how does this medical idea of health shape our way of interpreting the other natural experiences of life? You know, life has been increasingly medicalized. We're spending more and more money <coughs> on medical services. I mean, the whole world economy almost came to another um, cl cliff edge a few days ago when um, Obamacare, which is simply the wish to give medical uh, help to the poor in the world's richest country, uh, that brought you know the financial shutdown in the U.S. and uh, almost led to their default, their default in their debts, and uh, it would have been a huge uh, ripple effect uh, throughout the global economy. All are due, all due to this idea of medical treatment. So it's, it's clearly become deeply uh, embedded in our thinking about value, whether you believe in medical care for everybody or not. It's, it's the issue itself, the idea of medicine, the practice of medicine, uh, in modern terms, has become uh, one of, if not the most powerful, I suppose you'd have to put it alongside armaments, the arms trade, to get anywhere near some kind of sense of its uh, huge impact on the way we live. I mean, somebody's producing all these weapons that we that keep the wars going around the world. Uh, the same people who are producing the weapons are in the same countries, of course, are uh, organizing peace talks. You know. <laughs> so, where do, where, who's producing these weapons? The Americans, the Russians, the British, the Israelis, and so on. So anyway, uh, is there another uh, way of looking at health that mitigates or moderates this exclusively medical idea of health. Uh, if you think of the monastic idea of health, it's quite an interesting contrast. Um, in the desert monastic tradition, which has given us meditation, uh, and which the uh, Celtic monastic uh, wisdom was very closely related to, or, and a, a mirror of, really, even more than Benedictine monasticism. The Celtic monks were, were really the direct heirs of the desert fathers and mothers. So in the monastic uh, desert, health was seen as the result of, of deep prayer, of meditation. Now, they weren't speaking uh, about physical health, essentially. And I, as far as I can remember, I don't remember any healing stories, of physical healing stories, in among the desert uh, fathers' sayings and stories. I'd have to look it up. But I, I can't think, certainly, it's not a, a major theme of the desert uh, physical healing. But they do have a real sense that the work, the practice uh, of, of pure prayer, as they call it, Ratio Pura, uh, when they speak about prayer, in all of their sayings, they are speaking uh, about 
in the prayer of the heart or meditation, as we call it. And they see that as bringing about a health, a higher level of health, um, which is reflected in the body uh, sometimes. For example, there's a, a story where an old monk is is being questioned by some younger younger ones about his uh, his prayer and his spiritual practice, and they ask him some questions, and he tells them what they should do, how they should live, and then he says, "But um, if you want to be uh, perfect, which is could be translated as whole or complete, not perfect in the sense of." I've never made a mistake, but perfect in the sense of complete, like a, a perfect flower or something like that. Then he then he put his arms up like that, and he turned into flame. And the very tips of his fingers were illuminated by this inner um, light and fire of uh, of God. Uh, so there is a sense that the body is very much involved in this process. So the disciplining of the body uh, was not there to punish or to deny a person pleasure. Uh, they weren't Puritans in that sense. They didn't think it was bad to have pleasure. But they were very <coughs> careful and attentive to moderation. Although some of the stories might strike us as a little extreme, but actually, in their own terms, they were very moderate, um, like St. Benedict, uh, and they avoided uh, extremes. Then, in terms of the process of meditation, um, they were conscious that we go through stages as we move towards this wholeness or perfection. Um, the first stage they recognize could be a stage of enthusiasm and um, optimism, like when we begin to meditate, or like when you begin a new relationship or a new job, you're full of uh, the joys of spring, and you're full of hope and uh, energy and confidence, and uh, you don't see any problems in undertaking the work or the relationship that you've begun, uh, it fills you with uh, confidence and, and hope. And then, after a while, this initial enthusiasm begins to uh, become compromised by realities of life and the realities of your own ego or your own limitations. So you run into conflict with the person who few months before you thought answered all your problems and with whom you were a complete fit. And now you start <coughs> disagreeing over things and uh, your egos rub, rub up against each other. Or, you know, the colleagues at work or whatever else you've started to do begin to cause you trouble. And then it we fall into what the desert uh, wisdom called achadia. The achadia is that feeling of discouragement um, where you want to give up. You just don't think it's going to work for you anymore. So let's try something else. Let's try another relationship. Let's try another way of prayer. Let's try another religion. Let's try another course, you know. Uh, and so this feeling of a chalia can be extreme, can always bring you into depression um, and into a dark night of the soul, like John the Cross describes, a feeling of complete um, isolation and loss of enthusiasm and loss of hope, a uh, feeling of even being excluded from the wholeness or holiness from God uh, because of your inherent imperfections. 
So a chadia it might be intense like that, or it might just be, I can't bother be bothered to meditate today. You know, you know my meditation this morning was pretty much a disaster. So there's no point in you know doing it now. So you lose you lose confidence in the the value of the discipline, whereas before the discipline was something you could embrace happily, joyfully. So that's a chadia. And their advice in a chadia is uh, be in touch with people who are healthier than you are spiritually. And share your stuff with them. And then, as the Desert Fathers would say, go back to your cell and start meditating again. Keep going. That's basically what the teachers of the desert just are there to listen. They're therapists. Uh, they are doctors of the soul and uh, friends, spiritual friends. They're not a superior class. They're not like a, a clergy at all. They're monastic. They're not clerical. And they're not like a medical clergy either, you know. Uh, doctors and nurses, medical people have become a kind of priesthood. Uh, so these desert teachers were very much uh, at the same level as the people they were teaching, you know, a little bit more advanced, that's all, a little bit further along the way, but wounded healers. And many of the stories speak about uh, the teachers' um, humility, the humility of the teachers. Uh, who will generally refer to themselves as sinners, not in a pious way, but in the way that the Pope Francis does today, in that famous interview he gave, uh, when he was asked what he thought about himself, and he said, well, I think I'm a sinner. And uh, I think people knew he was, and he indicated that he was going back to some of his mistakes that he'd made in the past, when he was Archbishop of Provincial of the Jesuits in Argentina. I uh, didn't go into details, but people assumed that that's what he was referring to. So he was op genuinely open. And of course, when somebody does that, they don't pretend to be perfect <coughs> and godlike or clerically, you know, superior. Then, of course, you relate to them much more. And this is a problem very much, I think, in the medical. You may want to talk about this later in the medical world, where the doctor needs to be rather godlike in the same way as the priest, certainly in the Catholic Church, was put on a pedestal for nothing now, but was, was on it for a long time. So, uh, so when the 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 The, the seeker or the, the monk in the desert was suffering from a failure, they would go to one of these elders and uh, share with them, open their hearts to them, tell them their shameful deeds or shameful thoughts. And that was part of the therapy, was to be completely honest with them, to, to confess everything. Uh, not in order to get an absolution and to be told, Okay, you can go off and sin again. And you, you know, you go back. You, your debt is cleared. You can run up another debt. But uh, this was a much more uh, human and, um, uh, in a sense, respectful um, healing work. So then they would go back, and they they would now be reinvigorated to pick up their practice, their discipline themselves again. So that's a chadia and how to deal with a chadia. And then in this model of the spiritual journey that the monastic idea of health has, the next step is what they called apatheia, which literally means free from the passion. Apatheia. But 
but passions here, it doesn't mean, you know, the, the good passion that we might associate it with, you know, if you're passionate about something, it's seen to be a good thing. But passions, uh, literally for them, meant a disorder of the mind or the soul or the psyche. So it's where we're, where we're not working properly, we're out of order, um, we're out of harmony, something is in excess. So the passion might be anger, or lust, or gluttony, or greed, or pride, any of these states of mind which in themselves are natural and human, but can easily uh, overwhelm us and take us over. So to be free from passions, what does that mean? Then? It means that your mind, your soul, is in the right healthy state. It's in its natural state, which means a healthy state. And they refer to Apatheya, uh, one of the great teachers of the desert, Evagrius Ponticus, uh, describes as a little saying, Apatheya is the health of the soul. Apatheya is the health of the soul. And then, giving us an, another sense of what the monastic idea of health means, he said, and agape is the child of apatheia. Agape, of course, is the word that refers to boundless love. So love which is completely liberated. Our capacity for love uh, being completely uh, uh, released. And therefore, because this word agape is connected to the love of God, so it is when we are most godlike. Jesus tells us, you must love without bounds as your heavenly Father loves without bounds. So to be healthy is to be godlike. Your true nature is uh, one with your Creator. So apatheia is this balance and integration and harmony. It's when we're working at our best, when we're in a good space, when we are not inhibited by our passions of anger or pride or whatever, and we can simply be transparent, translucent, and generous. It's when we're at our best. And in that state of apatheia, of health of the soul, uh, agape, the love of God, flows freely in us and through us and out to others. So health is not simply something that I have, in the same way as medically we have diseases, but health is the sense of wholeness, the sense of connection and of an economy in which we are flowing. Uh, in which we are exchanging ourselves for others and giving ourselves to others. So, here's another uh, idea, maybe you can come up with, I'm sure, other ideas of health, but the medical idea of health, and here's a monastic idea of health. Um, in the medical idea of health, we are we are constantly increasing the number of diseases that we are having to fight. Um, and psychological disorders are being discovered in, or named anyway. And of course, uh, the more, I don't know if this, if this is uh, true, but I suppose there's a, a connection between the discovery of a disease and the discovery of the drug that's going to cure it. And so there we become aware of you know, another uh, dynamic which is, has always been there in medical folklore, of course, the, as even that story uh, of, um, from the Gospel suggests, you know, the connection between medicine and money. That so this woman had spent all her money on doctors and failed to get healed. So, you know, Every you know, 
And what happens when, in modern medicine, uh, a doctor who wants to help, wants to make the patient feel better, but doesn't know what the problem really is that they're suffering from, but knows that they will make them feel better if they give them a prescription for something that won't do them any harm, hopefully, but uh, isn't probably going to do them any good either, but at least it sends them out of the office feeling a little bit better. Well, the, the doctor may not be getting any financial reward from that, but clearly it is connected to a financial motive, motivation in the idea of health. So these are just things, we, connections or associations we need to identify or discuss. It's not about condemning, but becoming aware of them. Um, so another concept, I suppose it's built into our medical idea of health today, which certainly wasn't there in the ancient world, as I can understand, was um, is the idea of life expectancy. That the a major role of health care providers, as we as we call them, in that phrase itself is very revealing, isn't it? You're providing health care. So we're providing the care that brings people to health. Anyway. Um, that uh, a major concern of that is to make you live longer. So in other words, our idea of health is quite uh, connected with the ideal of immortality. And we're even now you know, talking, speculating uh, about the possibility of you know, the human, uh, of medical science, being able to control the human body to the degree that it will be continuously replaceable. I mean, this is quite a strong idea in some stories and uh, films, and must be based on some medical research as well. Uh, it probably is an ideal for some medical practitioners or researchers that we should be able to cheat death or, or avoid death altogether. So although life expectancy has increased um, in most countries in modern times, even in recent years, I think uh, Barry was telling me it seems a big increase. The two life expectancy in Ireland has increased by two and a half years in the last ten years. Yeah. So, which would mean that in how many years will we be immortal then? <laughs> <laughs> it's like we're getting over every ten years, so eventually pass up. You need a paradigm shift to get immortality. Yeah, well, okay. It's the other way around. Every two and a half years, you get a tenure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's when you've done more. So, uh, I don't know if you've seen the film Amour. Have you? Have you seen it? Yes. About this old couple in Paris. Remember? It's a very uh, graphic, uh, earthy film, really, about this, this loving couple. Uh, who go through um, uh, old age, and she has a stroke. She's a pianist, music teacher. She has a stroke, and uh, he he begins. He, he he becomes her principal carer, very lovingly, caringly. And she has a second stroke, so she becomes now. Um, inarticulate and you know, totally um, incapacitated, really. And um, he has, a, has had a nurse in, and he has to bring another nurse in, and he discovers that the second nursing assistant is mistreating her. So 
so he gets rid of her. So he's back, you know, with this. He's an old man himself, too. Uh, impossible task, really, of caring for her. And what you see is, you know, the reality, the reality of, of life, of increased life expectancy. So um, we are living longer, but we're not necessarily living healthier. And the longer we live, um, I don't know if uh, she, uh, you're telling me the uh, principal causes of illness of the smoking, alcohol, smoking alcohol, um, uh, obesity, well, diet, exercise, weight, mm. and then high blood pressure, cholesterol, and diabetes. So they're driven off the first time, okay. or some of the first time. Mm -hmm. So the major cause is preventable. That's in the So what we should what we should think about this evening then is when we have our discussion is you know what does what do, what is the value of life expectancy if it is built upon being able to stay sick longer because you've got poor drugs that will help you to stay alive although you're still overweight and drinking too much smoking you know blood, high blood pressure and all the other things. The bad for you, and that that film, Amour, I mean, just shows they were all, they were living a very healthy lifestyle uh, by comparison. Um, but you know, the, the, the moral uh, punch of the film is um, whether it is worth while her staying alive, and uh, the uh, question is. Um, was his love for her expressed in his killing her when she became you know, uncarable for him in a sense and she wanted to die. So um, our medical idea of health seems to exclude the reality of death, the spiritual meaning of death, and the fact that it might be the right time to die. And you prepare for somebody for that. Now, how you do it, I think, you know, maybe that's a whole other set of questions about training. But a friend of mine went uh, for some tests recently, and uh, the person giving him the results said, well, he said, I wasn't expecting this but you've got uh, cancer of the liver, and there's nothing I can do for you. So, you, you know, I would reckon you've got about three months, so you don't have to ask me, you've got about three months. Mm. And it was really as like that, he said. Mm. He was completely sideswacked by it, and uh, mm. uh, he's actually dealing with it very well, but he was very conscious of mm. that this was not the best way to, you know, prepare somebody for the last stage of their life. Uh, anyway, so does, um, does the medical idea of health um, exclude the necessity of, and the need for death as a way of bringing life to its completion? Is death always a failure? Uh, this tragic end? And obviously death is painful, you know, maybe you can control the physical pain, but if there's, the person is in a set of loving relationships, at whatever age there's going to be pain uh, at loss and separation, somebody's going to feel pain. Maybe a lot or little, but somebody's going to feel pain, and the person, of course, is going to inevitably feel some fear. But um, is death a bad thing in terms of health, or is it actually a healthy thing to die at a certain stage when your life is complete? My friend who's worked with palliative care for so many years uh, says that you know the goal is that patients should die healed. When they die, they are healed in the whole sense. The person. 
Um, he's done research into quality of life, and his research shows that the majority of patients facing consciously the end of their life, and whose physical pain and discomfort is being cared for and controlled, and whose psychological needs are, are being addressed, the majority, the vast majority of these patients will say that they have never known a better quality of life. Mm -hmm. So what does that say about happiness and external sources of happiness? Clearly happiness doesn't, or, or if we see health as part of happiness, or happiness as part of health, then uh, it doesn't seems to depend upon just staying alive or even material well-being. So, does the medical idea of health, by excluding the meaning of death and the value of death and the timeliness of death, does that actually diminish our humanity and our sense of what health really means? Perhaps what has happened, not only in medicine, but in many areas of, of life, institutional life today, is that um, our advances in technology and techno-science have given us the sense of being in control, or the um, the goal of being in control of everything. Being in total control would be the ideal. You see it in, in governments, in the way the governments uh, are justifying surveillance at the moment. The crisis came in the US recently in the intelligence service, or in Britain they were wanting to bring in an identity card that would pretty well put everything that you are in a little chip. Um, the only reason they weren't able to do it in the end was because there was no money uh, to spend the billions of, that it was necessary to do it. So the idea of total control is, is an ideal in almost every area of life, in every institution. Uh, and in some institutions, like airlines or air traffic, I think we would like the idea of total control. That um, the safety of the airline does require a, a very high level of surveillance and control and, uh, and monitoring and so on. Uh, and there's a very high level of safety as a result. How that translates into the hospital is another matter, or into the therapeutic relationship with the patient in other fields of medicine. Maybe in the operating theatre, you want to have total control as much as possible. That would be an ideal. Be able to monitor every microbe and every procedure uh, to maximise safety. But does that intention of total control, total um, manipulation of all circumstances, does that translate into all aspects of the therapeutic relationship when the healer and the, and the sick person meet and at a human level. Um, but our, our obsession with controlling the existential condition of humanity with technical skills has certainly entered into our idea of health. That health is something that can be controlled. There's a pill for every condition. Uh, the era of natural death is over. Nobody dies naturally anymore. Or there's some cases they do. Ten percent of children in the US now are getting um, Ritalin. Ten percent of people in the UK are diagnosed with depression and are being medicalized for it and medicated for it. So normal human behavior 
is being controlled, diagnosed, evaluated, labeled. A new mental illness is appearing every week. Um, these are all aspects of this, in, this aspiration to exercise total control over every mood and physical condition of life. Which would mean, and in some ways people do say it does mean, that we get to the point where the human condition becomes a medical condition. The pain or sadness or anger, whatever the reason for them, uh, are drug-controlled conditions. And the consequences of that socially and in terms of how we see the human being are quite um, powerful, you know, quite, quite, quite extreme. It means, for example, that everybody, every condition is seen to be an aberrant condition. It's a condition that needs to be corrected. And there's some concept of a homogeneous state where we are all the same and we should be all the same and if we're not all the same then we're we're um, we're wrong and we need to be made uniform I mean that's the underlying assumption of that kind of um, attempt to have complete control labeling and defining individual conditions, uh, which means we all see ourselves as deviant in some way, because of the odd, the odd things we have about us. Um, it can give a certain kind of relief. I mean, I think if you're suffering, you're, say you're, you know, a person is suffering from some pain, discomfort, dis dysfunction, and they go worried about it for medical tests and, and the tests don't come up with anything and the problem is left undiagnosed that today creates a feeling of deep anxiety it's like not knowing your enemy um, we have a disease or we have something wrong but we can't label it and then when you get the call and it says now I've, I've labeled it for you I've named it as a feeling of relief at least it's labeled and hopefully there is a cure for this well it's just a set of, of connections in the way we relate to health that um, has has, has, has become compounded in that way. So, we, we begin this week of reflection by asking what is health? What kind of definition or model of health are we working with? Are we conscious of the dominant model, medical model of health? And can meditation help us to understand what health uh, really means what it is to be healthy. If what is to be healthy means to be human, then uh, that humanity is not a system built upon perfection or upon predictability. It's not a system that can be completely controlled. Human beings change. They can be unhappy and become happy. They can be addicted and become free from the addiction. They can become, uh, uh, you know, psychopathic, and they can be uh, they can be made into uh, unangry and loving people. So we can change, and these changes are not um, explicable entirely by um, systemic or technological intervention. <coughs>